So, uh, hi everyone. Um, it is a bit odd, as I was just told, that you can't actually hear yourself speak. So it's literally like being in a bit of a vacuum. But um, nonetheless, I'm going to try and make this, um, this uh, work. I'm Julian uh, Oliver. I'm from uh, New Zealand. I'm living here in Berlin. This talk will be in English, unless, of course, you'd like to hear a three-year-old speak in German about um, the public space, private space, the commons, and wireless technology. So in the event you probably don't want to hear a three-year-old speak on those topics, I will speak in English. Um, my, my talk was initially um, given this sort of rather posh title. Um, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's got the classic sort of academic, um, you know, colon in the middle where you, you make a statement, but then you, you rephrase it or re-embody it in some way. So it used to be this, urban e exploits, rethinking the commons in an age of wireless communication. And due to a very fortuitous... Um, um, uh, mess up with um, with uh, with Verena, one of the organisers. Um, the first line of my talk description was actually taken as the title, which is, um, "If the air we breathe is considered public, then why not that which passes through it?" And I think that's, this is actually, in many ways, a better frame for the talk. But I'm going to be talking about um, about about this in the context of um, the electromagnetic spectrum, of spectra, of, um, of, of telecommunications infrastructure and wireless uh, communications technologies. When I'm talking about um, the, the commons, uh, the commons, I'm obviously talking about a very, very complex thing that comprises both um, public and, well, includes both public and, and private elements. And it is quite awkward to, 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 to neatly summarize the commons um, you know, historically, one, one can never speak about it as a singular thing. The Commons has, has evolved immensely over the over the years. Um, even now, we struggle a lot to to define the Commons, especially as even though the Commons um, includes both a, a material domain and a and a cultural domain, what what includes culture has has been radically reshaped, if you like, by the advent of of, um, of digital computing and um, and uh, computer networking. So yeah, it's got cultural and material domains. But just to start talking about the cultural domain, I mean, one, for instance, can, can consider uh, language and all the world's languages as themselves being very much a part of this thing that we refer to as, as the commons. We all have a right of access to learn a language, to study a language, to even speak a language. There, there are no languages, um, at least that I'm aware of, that, that one isn't actually allowed to freely engage and study and learn and redistribute and, and even possibly contribute to. In fact, it's, it's a very early form of source code. One could think of language um, by very virtue of the fact that it, that it evolves through use and even productively through misuse. I mean, Shakespeare is said to have invented some 1,600 words in his lifetime, like words like strange and weird and bedhead and advertising were all invented by Shakespeare. So language is something that we have right access to as much as read access. We can, we, you know, borrowing from a sort of computer, computer science uh, terminology, we have the right to, to, to read that code and also write back into it. Wikipedia is, of course, very much a part of, of, of now what we would understand to be the cultural commons, and it's a, it's a significant contribution to, if you like, the, um, the, 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 the commons and not just the... As, a, as, as an archive of, of common knowledge, but knowledge that can be written too. And it, it, is, it is undoubtedly a massive, um, has asked for a massive uh, reinvestigation, rethink of, 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 the, of the cultural commons in that regard. I mean, public libraries have often fulfilled a role as, um, as, as, a, as a guarded body of knowledge that, that sort of metered its, 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 its right of access. But, but to be able to, of course, I mean, it's a very fashionable word, democratise the, the, the authoring process is, is undoubtedly significant. The Linux kernel is another good example of, um, of, of, of the commons in a cultural domain. That starts to get a bit tricky because, again, we see a very early example of, of the commons sort of creeping over into the technical sphere. This is something that, that is maybe not quite as clearly delimited in historically as it is uh, presently now, where we have a common code base, one which is so of, of such vast importance um, to to infrastructure, to the running of power stations, to you know the, the future combat systems, to um, to you know what your router runs, um, to the domain of smartphones, and even my laptop. 
Um, but yeah, th this is also similarly a, 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 a cultural common um, um, object, if you like, if we can possibly call it that. Television in the context of, uh, of broadcasting is also considered to be part of the cultural commons. So we have this interesting, interesting phenomen phenomenon of, um, of, of television towers broadcasting content that we all have a right to read. We don't have a right to author, but we have a right to read. And that's, um, that's something that, that even with the advent of, of people having to pay a broadcasting fee or being asked to pay a broadcasting fee, e even though that, 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 that broadcast itself is privately owned, it's, it's publicly shared, or at least it's publicly accessible. So again, the, one can't talk about the commons as just merely the, 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 the private sphere and the public sphere. And as we start getting into spectra and the electromagnetic domain, things get really quite weird. Almost as weird as this man, uh, Wagner. Va Wagner's um, works are, for instance, also seem to be in the. I mean, this man's got such an amazing face. It's, you can really see like um, like Valkyries um, riding out of his face. I mean, this, he, this man's face looks like his music. It's incredible. But um, yeah, Wagner is a really good example of um, of someone whose work is considered to be now a sort of a, a public treasure. It's it's a gift. It's a publicly owned cultural object or set of objects. In fact, anything after 19, I think 1923, January the 1st, like for instance Virginia Woolf's writings, um, any, sorry, anything previous to um, January the 1st, 1923, is considered to be um, similarly in the public domain. It's in, it's in the cultural commons. Um, now, wh where, do the, where does this stuff end up? It ends up traditionally in, in book form, as we saw before with televisions or manuscripts as far as Wagner's concerned. Or, you know, orchestral works that might have a public outcome, but it's increasingly ending up on, on hard disks, of course. And Wikipedia is naturally um, a good example of hard to ha hard disk to hard disk um, end to end um, um, distribution of this of this cultural common material. But moving into the material domain, uh, therefore, we will probably um, be most familiar with the commons in the context of something like a park. This is the beautiful park behind my um, my studio and home, actually. And uh, this is Hasenheide Park here in uh, here in Berlin, and it's just it's a really fucking beautiful park. I love this park, um, and and I, I I love it and I celebrate it and I really do I must say like the way that that um, that Berliners actually celebrate this as a commons. I mean, even the way that they sort of distribute themselves um, with these sort of equidistant metric or something like this, this self-sorting algorithm of like, um, I'm not going to piss you off and you're not going to piss me off. We're just going to keep our dogs um, not licking each other's mouths um, or, or asses, um, you know, at certain distances. I love hanging out in this park. Um, a park is a place whereby um, we, we, are, we are allowed to, to, to enjoy and, and share the enjoyment of that park. But similarly, we're not allowed to chop a tree down, for instance. We're not allowed to, to start a huge fire. We're not allowed to even dig a hole. We're not allowed to do these things in, in, this, common, um, in this common space. And that already represents quite a shift from the very early origins of, of the commons as it was, as it was found, if, well, founded, if you like, in, in European history whereby um, uh, one was a commoner, one had access or right of access to common land. You could, you could chop down a tree, you could use the land, you could even you know, milk your goats on that land and, and graze them or whatever. One thing, however, that does stick with any definition of the commons is that the commons cannot be commodified, or, other, or else otherwise it wouldn't be the commons, it would be entirely privatised. And of course, when we, when we start looking at, at, at that in public space, things also get a bit weird. We've got this um, phenomenon of, of, of advertising creeping up onto the, onto the surfaces of our commons, but not actually in the commons themselves so much. But with, with advertising and smartphones, things do start to get, get a bit more complex there. This is um, Piccadilly Circus in the, in the UK, in London. And, uh, and, and now, the, the, the value of this commons has actually become... Um, I guess it's, it's inflated furthermore by virtue of the fact that the advertising has become a spectacle. So people are actually literally going to this place to enjoy the, to bask in the neon light of, 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 um, of this as a kind of a, yeah, as, a, as an animated surface. Um, but then we have, we have these weird places like the arcades that, that Walter Benjamin wrote a lot about. These are, are, are definitely public spaces. One is in them in, 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 a, in, a, in a public sense. 
but because they have this little enclosure over the top of sorts, um, they almost represent the fact that they are in fact semi-privatised. You can't, for instance, in, in the arcades of Paris, pick up your violin and start playing. You can't, for instance, hand out flyers with, 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 without certain paperwork you know, taken care of. Th these are regulated spaces. They're sort of semi-common or, or hybrid spaces. I would argue that, in fact, the, um, the, the arcades and what we often refer to as open, open shopping malls are in fact a better metaphor for understanding how the internet is also a kind of a semi-privatised hybrid, hybrid commons. Another good example of, of, a, of, a, of something that, is, that, that has the outward appearances of a commons but, but is absolutely the opposite, just to again um, constructively or productively complexify this thing that we call the commons, is, um, is the, the, the foyer of a hotel. You know, you might have people from many, many different cultures um, hanging out, doing all the kinds of things one would assume that they could possibly do, even in a in a very overly well-mannered maybe town square. But um, it is absolutely a private a, a private domain. Increasingly, cities are taking um, are, are taking on these projects. This is, um, I think, it's in Suzhou in uh, in China. We had these huge outdoor shopping malls surrounded by just this encrustation of, um, of commission flats, of residential you know, projects. And, and so the, the idea is you literally put this you know, UFO in the middle of all of it and, um, and you wrap it up, you put parks in it, but you ensure that the entire um, experience is guarded and controlled, steered, regulated and maintained. In fact, it's just, just because it doesn't, you know, even though it doesn't have a roof on it, does not mean at all it is not an entirely privately governed place. There's a, a project I kicked off in, uh, in 2008 um, called The Artvertiser, which um, I wrote about three and a half thousand lines of, 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 of C code to get this thing off the ground just so it could run on these binoculars such that when you're walking around the streets with these, these retro futuristic looking binoculars you see, you see artwork instead of advertising. So you're literally replacing on the fly in real time um, advertising with, um, with artwork made by the people in that area and, and this is a project that's been shown all, all around the world now but we found that that even going into certain open-air shopping malls around the world and using this 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 work of augmented reality I call it improved reality um, we get policemen or members of the public coming up and telling us that we can't manipulate our own cognition we can't we can't actually look at the advertisements and see art instead because that would be denying the advertisers their right to manipulate our experience of public place. So I mean, that's getting a bit away from the, the, the topic at hand, but, but just, just to again talk about the, how, the, how, how, the, how the networked and, and digital domain is deeply complexifying um, our understanding of, of public, private and the commons. Now, this, well this open air shopping mall here in, in China, it hasn't been built yet. If it has been built and it looks like that, then the world really is becoming a 3D model. Um, but the, the, air, the air itself, I mean, the air itself, is, is that, is that privatised? I mean, we understand the air to be almost the very root, atomic, platonic, even, um, denominative thing of, or, you know, substrate of this thing we call the commons, that the, the air we breathe is, is undoubtedly and, and unnegotiably considered public. But the, the, the air itself is already a site for a tremendous number of, of, of different competitive forces and, and influences um, overlapping the public and the private. Again, if I'm back in that park and I'm breathing that air, I can even be by myself on that park bench and breathing it, but the air is being used. The air is being used, for instance, for insect and animal communications. Um, this, um, this moth here, this male moth, um, can actually um, smell and using a, an electrochemical process, um, female moth pheromones about three kilometres away. So it, it is that the antenna on this moth actually are, are part of a, of a of a very sophisticated long-range communications infrastructure within this uh, within this species. We are hearing, um, well, we are not hearing bird call and insect call all the time, um, but nonetheless we're, we're we're very much submerged in, in in a substrate which is being used for wireless uh, communication. Looking at it from the perspective of, uh, of, of spectra, we see, for instance, the um, FM and, and AM and microwave, I'll be talking a lot about microwave, um, is, is more within the realm of what we understand to be um, modern human implementations of, um, of communications uh, infrastructure. Long radio waves, they're in the, um, yeah, in the, 
yeah, the, the, the very, very low frequencies um, are typically used for like naval and police, et cetera, et cetera, um, army stuff. So what can I hear when I'm actually in that park myself? I mean, I can hear birds, insects, and dogs, and I can hear those incessant infernal hippies trying to play African drums all the time. Um, I, I can hear them, unfortunately. But, um, but these, these, um, the, these things are within a very, very narrow window of, 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 of experience. I mean, air pressure is being... You, air, changes in air pressure is what my eardrum is, is registering when I'm hearing those, um, those hippies singing Om Namah Shivaya, or whatever the name of their moon goddess is. But, um, but nonetheless, you know, r radio and... and, and um, well, as, 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 a, as a human with a pair of ears, I am, I'm a broadcast receiver. I'm receiving broadcasts, right? It doesn't matter, for instance, if someone is, 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 is whispering to the person next to them or they are shouting from the other end of the park, um, Om Namah Shivaya, which this hippie was shouting the other day. Uh, yeah, hippie, sorry. I'll stop going about hippies. <laughs> um, but... Um, yeah, the, um, it doesn't matter that once it has left the mouth, once it has left the, the instrument or whatever, it, it, is, it is in the air. And from the perspective of my eardrum, it is merely a broadcast receiver. On the, on, the, on the very physical level, it is not making a distinction between should I have heard that or not. And I will be, I'll be talking a lot about, about, um, yeah, about wiretapping and eavesdropping in, in a second. I could augment my experience in that park by actually pulling out a radio. I could pull out a radio and sit it on the grass and I could listen to um, the news, sports results. I could tune into a um, you know, musical program or something like that. I, I'm, I'm extending, one could more fashionably say, augmenting my, um, my, my experience. And the, the, the moment I'm doing that, I'm, I'm already stepping outside of, 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 of a realm of, of what is you know, overtly apparent to my, to my organic infrastructure and I'm extending it into the technical domain. What's interesting about, about radios from the perspective of broadcast is again they are generally privately owned um, um, uh, corporations that have paid for the right to broadcast within a particular range um, of, of spectra um, in, a, in a particular region. So it can be a private enterprise that has a public broadcast outcome. Um, I can, however, also take something like um, like a, a smartphone out of my pocket and further augment into um, into other domains. I can move into the 802.11 um, wireless communication specification space, which is effectively microwave, um, 2.4, 3.6, uh, 3 and 5 gigahertz. When I'm working um, with a 2.4 uh, gigahertz um, to 2.5 gigahertz block, I am I'm effectively in, in in the same range that your microwave oven is at home. Um, as a test, for instance, you can try and um, connect to the internet while you're cooking a pumpkin in your microwave while using your wireless network at home. The, the microwave will be absolutely dominating that, um, that, that part of the, of, of, the, of, the, of, of the spectra. Your phone is capable of doing that if you're using one of these intelligent phones. But GSM in Europe is typically, um, is typically 900 to uh, 1,900 megahertz. It's 2G and 2.1 gigahertz for, for 3G. So that's, a, that's a, further, a further extension. But what I'm doing with, with, um, with these two different things is, is quite different. With the 802.11 wireless networking functionality on my phone, I'm doing something very similar to what radio is doing already. I, I am, I'm, in a, I'm in a kind of a near field broadcast potential as, as a receiver. I can't hear um, wireless packets sent from someone's router um, five kilometers away. Generally, I've only got line of sight at best of a, of a couple of hundred meters. But for GSM, I'm joining a much broader network, that, that the cellular net network, that it will immediately extend, immediately extend in just one hop, the reach of my phone to, to a vast variety of other, um, of, of other, um, of other communication spaces. Of course, with a, with a gateway on that wireless network, um, I can reach the internet as well, but nonetheless, typically people are used to just seeing this. They, 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 re, they re realize that this actually relates to their phone, but the idea of a Wi-Fi zone is, is very much like a kind of a radio zone. In fact, technically speaking, the, the wireless device on a, on, a, on a smartphone or in a laptop or a tablet computer is technically, it's a, it's a radio device. It's, it's a 802.11 specification is a radio specification. 
this is on a um, on an iPhone 5. This is where the this is where the um, the wireless uh, NIC is, and in the purple part, that's actually where the chip is on a, on an iPhone 5. So um, so from yeah, from from insect and animal communications right through to to um, to, to radio and television and then into the wireless domain as I, as I say 2.4 gigahertz typically is, is what we use when we're using wireless networks and the GSM the world has very much become a cable I mean right now in this room um, SM, right now in this room PNGs GIFs JPEGs emails um, HTML fragments are passing through our very body at at, at this at this very moment we, we are we're a part of the cable we're a part of the transmission material I'm just going to um, pop out of here and just uh, show you very quickly. Um, just how much one can actually see. This is, for instance, just a, a, a quick basic packet dump of what's, what's happening in this environment. A tremendous amount of, 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 of traffic. Anything that looks garbled will probably be encrypted. Um, uh, or, or gzip compressed, or it will just be binary, binary, bu binary data blobs. But right now, you have on the left you have you have a, a formatted hex uh, hex dump, and on the right you have you have ASCII output. Um, I can take that hex directly and turn it straight back into into the into the actual data itself as intended. I'm going to show you a, a little project I did that, that does that in a second. But that's passing through us right now. Our, our bodies are no barrier for, for, this, for the movement of this stuff. Our bodies are no barrier. We're, we're a part of the cable. Um, and there's a little project I did um, just, as a, just as a sketch for a little exhibition we had in our studio in Weiserstrasse 7 in, in Neukölln. Um, and uh, and yeah, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to create a bridge, if you like, between the domain of, of, of television and, and, and wireless as, as, a, as a public broadcast. In other words, when people are using your phones for wireless networking, your laptops for wireless networking and stuff, you, you are, when you're sending an email, you're, you're practically sending it in broadcast. And I wanted to kind of communicate um, that we don't have an intimate relationship with, with the BBC, we don't have an intimate relationship with, with, with even a friend on the other side of the world to which you're sending an email. There are many, many computers involved along the way, and we'll, we'll talk a bit about that, but that anyone else in that immediate environment can tune in their radio and listen to, uh, to what you're doing. And, and I'm, I'm a big fan of, of beautiful old televisions. Um, I, gr I grew up in New Zealand in, in a very rural place, so we were sort of a bit behind with the, with the TVs. We had really old TVs, and I've, I've got a you know I've got a sentimental attachment to old TVs. And it's very sad here in Germany to see these beautiful old 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 machines, these these devices, these broadcast receivers sitting in um, in in, in uh, secondhand markets, flow marks, and stuff like that. Um, with no one to broadcast to them because the whole analog television thing is is over. It's done. Um, unless you are digitally capable as a television, you, you have no one to talk to, effectively. So what I wanted to do was to take it the analog TV format and, um, and, 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 and give, it, give it a new broadcast station. What I've done is I've made it such that every wireless device in its environment becomes its television tower. Need some audio though, this needs some sound. Is the, where's the mixer guy? Is he around? Yeah, a bit of sound.
Yeah, no, um, it's just a, a very, very simple little sketch, um, and it's a it's relatively bad documentation. I haven't had a chance to document it properly, but I'm doing a whole range of these. I'm doing about 10 old t TVs, each of which have a tiny little parasite computer in them with a little um, wireless uh, network interface that is listening in, in, in monitor mode. It's, it can hear any anything in the air that is not effectively encrypted. And of course I can actually join an encrypted network and hear all that too, but the idea is to just, is again, to give these beautiful old analog televisions a, um, a, a TV tower again in the absence of, of, of them. So back over to here, on that note. So um, yeah, we, we have already this, this idea, we've uncovered um, what we've covered of the, of the commons as being a complex mix of the, of the public and, and the private, but in, in, in the domain of air, of air itself, this thing that we understand to be absolutely public, it's already totally infused with, with, um, with, with, with private um, a public contradictions. It's a, air is a, a very good example of the public and the private and the private and the public. Um, so how, how, do, how do wireless networks interplay with the commons? A classic example is this sort of, is this, you know, I guess kind of mobile office, um, home, you know, mobile office mecca um, Sankt Oberholz where I think anyone now that comes into Berlin with a, with a, with a recent Mac has to go there first. Um, yeah, it's just... One of us. There's one of us, man. This is exactly. No, um, um, and it's 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 a it's an amazing place. When I was first in St. Albert I could not believe just just the 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 um the sheer density of 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 uh, of, of computer users in there. This seamless blend of of, of coffee, focaccia, and and um and Facebook, and um, <laughs> Facebook should just buy it. Um, St. Albert <laughs> No, it's a lovely place, really lovely place, and, and the owner's really nice. And um, he's been really good, good to us, and we've been in there and we've been playing around. It's quite remarkable. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be doing some, um, um, you know, you'll be synthesizing audio or MPEG streams or, or, or images, just playing around on, 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 a, on an open network in a cafe. Now, importantly, it's an open network. But is that network really public? I mean, I, I don't have to necessarily go inside there and, and, and sit down and buy a coffee to use it. In fact, I've even gone to Sankt Oberholt, sat down and, 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 and not bought a coffee and used it. But what if I'm using that network or even misusing that network from outside the, the very territory that's delimited by the physical constraints of Sankt Oberholt? What happens if I'm outside in a white van, um, um, you know, using this, uh, using this service? Now, when I'm inside, I'm very much sort of in, inside the domain of, of, of what is understood to be a, a private space, but I'm using a network which, which is, is given as a, as, a, as, a, as a service, but it's not strictly a public service. If I'm, if I'm um, reconstructing people's web pages as they are browsing or something like that, or I'm looking at the images that they are, um, that they are you know, downloading or uploading or whatever when I'm on this network, am I, am I eavesdropping or am I listening? This is a very interesting question given the fact that, again, all I'm doing is, 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 a, is putting my card into maximal hearing mode. That's what a monitor mode is in the, in the, in the information security space when you're talking about wireless networking and, 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 and packet capture. I'm, I'm, I'm really opening my ears. It's the equivalent of me lying down in the park and closing my eyes and trying to hear everything that everyone is saying. But that puts me in a very, very difficult sort of legal territory immediately. Even though on a technical level, I'm, I'm only fully using the technology that's been given to me, but in, a, in, in the sense of the commons, I'm stepping on several toes. We like to think of, of encryption as a kind of a, of a boundary wall. We think of, we think of um, you know, these, these keys like WPA keys that we, we're used to seeing when we're setting up a, um, our wireless router at home or, or when we're typing in you know, passwords and bits and pieces. WEP keys, pretty easy to break in, in, in just a few minutes really. But, um, but a browser login or a pay-per-use we also think is, of as a kind of a wall, but this is something that is very, very easily um, in many, many cases um, gotten around. But um, but the encryption itself becomes, a, becomes a, a kind of a physical wall of sorts, or at least it's imagined that way, as though it was made of brick and concrete and said, no, damn it, you know, this is, this is where, this is where our, our enterprise ends, you know, it stops here. You can't get inside this building and you can't get inside this network. 
But what if I'm to, for instance, go into a, um, into a cafe that does have an encrypted network and I buy a cup of coffee for a couple of bucks? I get the key, I drink my coffee, I, um, I terrorise people on Facebook. I don't have a Facebook account actually, but I know I, I'm just generally nasty and horrible. And, um, and then think, um, um, you know, go away and then come back the next day and sit outside or over the road or at my friend's apartment upstairs and continue to use that network, you know. Have, 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 I, ex have I extended, if I give that key out to friends as well, have I extended those commons? Where am I in the sense of the public and the private and these delimitations? Once I have the key to a wireless network, am I, am I part of a group as well? Um, if, if, I, if I do get the key and I, I, and I join that group, are we having a conversation together? Are we all, are we all hanging out? I mean, is, is, it a, is it a party? What if I return to use the network but sit in a car over the street? Yeah, whose space am I in? And this, this brings up the, the volatility of data. Data itself becomes, um, becomes a territory as valued and, and, and preserved and, and cherished and, um, and governed and guarded as, for instance, the, 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 the trees in Hasenheide Park. I can't walk up and cut a branch off a tree or chop a tree down or bring my goats in to graze or set up a fence or dig a hole. I can't do those things. That I'm, I'm, I'm part of a commons, but I'm, I have certain rights and responsibilities. Data itself becomes this very flammable thing. It's a project I, I made for an exi exhibition at the, in Labo, Labo Berlin in the Haus der Kultur und der Welt um, as part of our studio exhibition. We had 10 pieces in the show and it's, it's called The Transparency Grenade. And uh, Suzanne Stauk, who I would hope she was here but I don't think she could make it on time, she um, uh, did all the silver work on that. I'll, I'll to tell you about it a bit in a moment. But it takes the form of a Soviet um, F1 hand grenade. It's a very, very violent and successful weapon uh, used in many wars. But instead of having explosives on the inside, it has a small um, ARM-based um, computer running a very stripped-down um, GNU Linux uh, distribution. That I've spent quite a bit of time, uh, you know, stripping it down. It's got a it's got a broadband uh, wireless antenna. It's got a Nintendo DS battery, and it's got a microphone. When you pull the pin on the grenade, it captures all of the wireless traffic in your environment, and and anything that the that the that the microphone can hear, and tunnels it to my server where it is mined for JPEGs, GIFs, PNGs, email fragments and HTML fragments and then put on a map at that actual location of the detonation. So for instance if you if if you if you walk into if you know if you're a trusted member of an organization or something like that, you know, security guard waving you in, and walk into the um, into the meeting, pull the pin and make what is otherwise the closed meeting absolutely public. It, it, it's a direct pipe from the private to the public um, uh, domain. It's like InstaLeak or something like that. So you could be a disgruntled civil servant. You could be a um, you could be a, you know someone who works in a corporation that's just really sick of the the lies or the bullshit, and you would like to um, you would like to to both um, um, organisationally suicide and um, and and you know go out with a proverbial bang. It's it's a handheld iconic solution to the problem of a lack of transparency in corporate and governmental domain. Um, here's some drawings of it before the printing. Uh, Suzanne Stark, she's an amazing um, goldsmith. She did the, all the metal work. Um, here's my electronic studio in, uh, in Weiser Strasse 7. It's me working on it. It's got a, it's got a, a resin, um, printed resin um, uh, body with this lovely silver caps. There's all the bits uh, laid out. It's the broadband, um, well, the, the very, it's, it's a, it's, yeah, it's AB, ABGN, or ABG antenna, it's a very good antenna. And, um, yeah, it's got, I've got a very sort of CSI-like map, I suppose, but in the classic CSI, we have a dilemma, you know, sort of thing, but in San Francisco. And, um, and yeah, you, you can, you can browse in real time the, the images that have, that are being, being viewed on that network. So, for instance, if someone is, um, uh, if someone is using an iPhone or that network, they would probably have a username that would be the host name of the device would be the name of their user. So, quite often you see it would be something like Kara's iPhone or John's iPad or Dan's Android or Dan's S3 Galaxy S3. You will see this up here. You see the IP and you see what they are doing at that point, what they are browsing. And there's many different. Uh, 
yeah, I've, I've, naturally it's entirely illegal to provide this as a service, but I am um, developing an Android application at the moment um, that I'll be distributing, maybe at the end, because I'm, I'm going to run out of time. It's at an exhibition at the moment, I, I, would, I would love to, but the thing is I can't actually legally do it. I, I wanted to build this, this device as a means of, of, of also pointing out some of the some of the difficulties, really, it's, it's an object that I can't even legally use. I can't even provide the service, you know, without, without being kicked, kicked back with a very sore ass all the way back to New Zealand, you know, I, just, I can't actually physically use the thing, but I can build it, I can implement it, and I can prove it works, and then I can, I can um, allow it to open up some very, what I think to be important conversations. Um, the Android application I, I will be distributing freely, including the source code, and um, the server-side code I will be distributing freely, and you can set it up yourself, but I can't provide the service. The thing is, is that we, we can't, can't say that we know what's in our pocket, let, let alone what they really do. These, these phones, um, these smartphones, for instance, are, are lying about us all the time, or telling stories, or, you know, you know, dialing home. I mean, they're, they're really quite, um, you know, promiscuous to use another network, um, you know, another word network uh, terminology. They really are very promiscuous um, devices. The, um, yeah, quite troubling. The, the, the main thing is, I mean, fr from a, from a techno-political and cultural um, perspective, things have really become much harder for us in order to have a real sense of subjectivity as to these risks. A good example, for instance, is the music player of the turn of the turn of the um, the 20th century in the 1900s. We have um, we have the, the gramophone. The gramophone, I would describe it as a self-describing object. You know, it is somewhat practically open by design. One can even look at it and see where the sound comes out. You can see where the energy input is done. You know, kinetic energy. And when you, when you turn the crank, the wheel turns. If you look closely enough at the record, you can actually see the little tiny grooves on the record and the needle sitting on those grooves. And so, so, so the whole process from energy inputs to, to, to sound out is described in this object. But compare it to the iPod Nano, for instance. It's just a field of surfaces, metaphors. It's an, it's, it's, it's a, it's an iconographic um, interface to what's inside. And few people you know um, even few people I know could could actually tell you how this works and what those parts do. You know, it's, it's an opaque, closed, um, ungenerous, non-self-describing object, and so it's very difficult for us to find entry points into understanding where where the thresholds of public and private, where, where our rights are, and 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 even what the objects that we depend upon, you know, the, the risks that they um, that they introduce, even the right to open those things. Um, is increasingly contested. You know, we 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 are actually stepping over a legal threshold, as the previous uh, speaker introduced. We're, we're stepping over a, a legal threshold when we open up a a device that we we supposedly own. Uh, following on from what he said, um, I would say that if one can't, if one is, is disallowed the right. Or, or, or a warranty is breached, or you, you know, the right of repair or even the right of ownership is contested by modifying a device that you own or opening it up for, for, for inspection or for study, you don't own that device actually, you're effectively leasing it. So th th there are many walls between us and becoming better at understanding the, the, uh, you know, our, our subjectivity in this highly engineered um, um, uh, domain. There's a very nice project um, by some some uh, some guys. One of them, one of which is a friend of mine, uh, Drew Hemant. It's called Loca, set to Discoverable, which um, really ex explores some of this stuff. Um, they built um, a, a bunch of, of concrete blocks and put inside them um, a little phone um, that's 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 uh, got its uh, Bluetooth enabled. There's some code, little scripts and bits and pieces. When people are walking past these, um, these objects, probably not even noticing their existence, these um, objects are, are sending those phones messages. Those phones are receiving little messages. And for instance, one of the messages is, you know, you were in a flower shop and spent 30 minutes in the park. I, are you in love? You know, Th this, is, this, is, this is data that was gathered by the system. They had, they had a, one of these little modules outside um, a flower shop and then a couple in the park, and by, by, merely, by merely reading the, 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 the fingerprints, if you like, on a device level from those, from those devices in people's pockets as they were roaming about, they were able to produce 
quite simply a construction like this, a, a, a probability. But the, um, the, the cellular communications um, um, space, the telecommunications space, they're already well into this. Um, one, of, one, of, uh, one of my projects for, for this year has been documenting the phenomenon of stealth cell towers, you know, which is incredible. It's an incredible thing. Telecommunications companies don't want us to know that there are cell towers in our environment, and they, do, they go to extreme efforts, very creative efforts, to ensure that we don't know that they're happening. For, and they, they build these things that are actually not trees. They're not trees at all. They're not living. <laughs> They're, they're, they're nylon and <laughs> wire um, that, that look enough like trees for people to just a little bit like like um, like that to, to walk past them in public space and, and 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 not feel contested by them. What do I mean contested or threatened? I, I mean that um, with all the fear of, of 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 cellular communications and cellular disruption in the bodies, you know, putting cell towers next to schools is generally not considered to be a good idea. Um, people don't want to feel like um, that the technology is so much in their environment that, that, it, might, um, that it, it might take some of the charm out of some lovely antiquated heritage protected streets or there's all sorts of reasons. Some of them get really great, like cell tower disguised as a street lamp. Apparently the street lamp doesn't actually turn on. It, it's never worked. It's the only street lamp in, in about 500 meters, just sitting there by itself. They, you know, they, they could have gone that little extra step and supplied power and a light. But they, um, and there's um, antennas disguised as bricks, which I really like. Like someone has, someone's actually sat down and thought about that. They've gone up there maybe on a ladder with a camera and photographed the bricks and then gone down to the local print shop and then um, had them stuck onto the um, to cell towers. Yeah, just as any definition of the commons requires delimiting boundaries, any discussion of nationhood um, will, will always meet, meet the border. And uh, there's, a, there's a project um, of mine that I did this year. It was a commission uh, for a, a Liverpool-based festival called uh, Abandon Normal Devices. They're really amazing. If you ever have a chance to work with them, you should. And, and border bumping is, is a kind of a complex um, project, but I'm going to talk about one one aspect of it really, really quickly. And it's it's it, again, it's looking at at um, at the kinds of, of of ontologies and belief structures and investments and dependencies that that we build into these um, you know these these things. These guys, we, we really trust them a lot. We place a tremendous amount of trust, and I wanted to explore that trust, and I wanted to take, as a kind of dystopic proposition, what if telecommunications companies were themselves territories? What if they were countries to a certain degree? What if I could somehow find a way of pitching um, na nationhood and national borders with telecommunications companies to sort of put them at, at war a little bit? I was flying into Istanbul for ICEA, and as, as the plane was tipping, like this, and you could see the water, and you could see the city. It was a really wonderful moment, and it was quite a meditative moment, actually. I was looking at the water and looking at the, looking at the city. I hadn't been to Istanbul before. I was really excited, and um, and I was shocked out of my um, out of my little trance by the sound, the very cacophonous, dissonant sound of every phone on the plane getting an SMS from the telecommunications company saying, you know, welcome, welcome home, you know, and. Um, and I said to myself, well, this is where the border should be drawn. You know, the border of Turkey should be pulled out into the water and, and, and drawn there. And this is what I did. Um, I, I made a, a, an Android application that, um, that you, you start up before you cross the border, and it logs your position. And the moment that, that you, you switch um, MCC, the moment you switch from, from one cell tower to another, but you're, you're, you're legally within the national territory that you're standing in, like, you know, I might be in, in, in the north of, you know, north of Spain. Or, no, say I'm in Barcelona, I'm near France, right? I'm in Barcelona, and if I go up into the Pyrenees, there's certain points I can go up there where, where I can be physically standing in Spain, but my phone will switch over to, to, to France. You know, welcome to, you know, of, you know, or, Orange, Orange FR, you know, something like this. You know, and, and this, this, will, this will really happen. And, and these are very interesting moments. These are moments that are being actively used by gun traffickers, um, uh, drug dealers, um, people inter inter interested in all sorts of um, um, contraband because their device is in one location but their body is in another. It puts them in a very interesting um, field of, of potential. Um, Till uh, Nagel and, uh, and Christopher Peach I worked with to develop a, a mapping um, application such that all of the, um, the, the, the SMSs from these phones, when there is this border disparity event, are sent 
to the, to the server where they're rendered on a map. And I'll just quickly show you what that looks like on the map now before running out of time in my talk, which I am going to. Um, yeah, looks like this. So th these are these are real these are real inputs that are coming from real people that are running my app on their phones as they're crossing borders around around Europe. The borders are being redrawn based on their proximity to the border and the discrepancy between th their network context and their physical context. You can go to borderbumping.net and, and download the app and then run it when you're next crossing a border. It is, it's not so good naturally if you just fly into an airport, because that would pull the border right into the middle of a country or something like that, so it doesn't work. But, but if, you're, if you're walking across the border, which sometimes happens, or you're driving, or in a train, or in a bus, it's, it's perfect. So that's that. Quickly stop that. And back to the thing. Um, yeah, trust in engineering. Um, inf infrastructure is, is what we're trusting in when we're trusting in when we're, we're placing our maximal trust in engineering. There could be no better example, for instance, than the um, aerospace infrastructure. You know, when you when, when the plane is lifting off, you, you are you are you are giving yourself to a to a tremendous complexity of of engineered infrastructure, from telecommunications of air traffic control right through to um, uh, turbine engines. Engineering infrastructure is very much a part of our environment, you know. So it follows that 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 to, to not and this is a critical engineering principle, to not have the basic vocabulary to be able to describe your environment on the terms in which it's given, its engineered its, its engineeredness, it, it, its techniques, is to put you in a critically vulnerable position. It's to be in a critically vulnerable position. One doesn't have to be an engineer to be able to have a, a, a basic understanding as to how the internet works, for instance. You can ask almost anyone you know how the postcard you, you sent them arrived in their mailbox and they'll be able to give you a relatively coherent description of how that postcard actually got there. But if you ask them to describe how the email you sent them arrived in the inbox, you'd be better writing it down and putting it into a poetry journal. It'd be, it'd be like a work of high surrealism. It is, it's very difficult for people to grasp the abstraction of, 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 of modern computer networking, and it's understandable. But there's a lot of effort to ensure that we, we can't have easy access to this stuff. Unintended emissions. So, um, as I was talking before about smartphones, every um, Every um, wirelessly enabled device using you know, wireless uh, networking technology has a, has a hardware signature. It's, it's either known as an MAC address, a MAC address, has nothing to do with Apple, um, or a hardware address. This is a hardware address of one of my networking, um, my, my wireless network devices. It's a brilliant um, project that I'm extremely jealous of. It makes it much worse because they're both my friends. But I think it's the best project in, in, in the best work of critical engineering and, and yeah, in all 2012, it was in the same exhibition in the House of Kultur und Welt, and it's called uh, Packet Brücke. It's just a beautiful project. Um, basically, the you know when you're using location services on your phone, and, and it says, you know, would you like to refine your position? You know, using GPS, or you can refine your location down to down to a matter of meters or something like that. What you're doing is, is, you're, is, is you're, you're, you're setting your phone into, into, a, into a mode whereby it is resourcing a huge database of, 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 of access point locations, access point, wireless access points, like the one in your home or the one in Sankt Oberholz that we looked at before. These themselves are part of a massive database. And, and beacon, beacon triangulation, beacon frame triangulation is used to locate you so what, what Packet Brooker did was to build um, a, a, a device like this that has, um, that has effectively a router for every single channel in the wireless spectrum and put it in our studio in, in Neukölln, Weiserstrasse 7, and put another one down in the Haus der Kultur in der Welt. Those, those special frames called beacon frames that, that, are, that are constantly, as, as we saw before, much of that traffic before was beacon frames um, fr from wireless networks. Uh, was captured in Neukölln in our studio that contains the names of, of local cafes and you know um, bars, um, home networks upstairs, and tunnels it securely all the way over to the House of Culture and Develop where they are where they are let out again. The result of that is people in the House of Culture and Develop during the exhibition 
we're, we're picking up their phones and we're going looking for, um, looking for a local bar or a local cafe or a restaurant to get something to eat. And they were being told that they were in Noikun. There were actually people walking out of, um, of House of Kautuna Develt into the darkness, you know, saying, it's over here, it's over here. You know, it was, it was, it was really quite amazing. Again, this, this, this implicit trust we, we, we place in infrastructure that, that, that this is telling me that this is, you know, this is middle manning, it's like a middle, man in the middle attack. It's, it's middle manning my relationship with the world. I'm being proxied through, a, through an infrastructure I might not necessarily have control of. Can, can computer networks be an extension of the commons? This is a really big question. Um, but before we, before we go into it, we'd have to, actually, before I go on anymore, um, because we're running behind, how, how much time have I got actually? In, in, all, in all seriousness? It's technically, yeah, but I've got two minutes. But that means I only got three quarters of an hour and I planned an hour talk. Three. Okay, then I have to skip through a whole bunch of stuff then. That's cool. So, so just open your eyes, don't, don't blink and let the, let the images just pervade deep, penetrate deeply into the back of your brain like this is a tick 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 I can just go to here then. I'm going to show you a movie which doesn't count as minutes because it's a movie and it's more entertaining. But the, basically, you hear this a lot, right? The access to the internet is a fundamental human right. And I'm, I'm often in, in these panels or in or a human, um, where you've got humanities um, folk, often very, very bright, that because they don't have a, um, a, a rudimentary understanding of, 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 of what the internet is or what a computer network is really, and they couldn't describe how an email is actually sent, they, they, they find themselves in a, in, a, in a place whereby they are describing um, something as a commons well, whereby it doesn't actually otherwise exist. The internet doesn't belong to the people, it, however, does belong to those that own the cables, and this is very much the case. The submarine cable map I really recommend checking out. The submarine cable map will, um, will show you all of the, a map of all of the undersea cables that make this thing called the internet actually work. And you can click on these cables and you can see the companies that own them. You, you'll be very hard pressed to find a single government that has even a share in these cables. Um, uh, when I was teaching in, uh, with Danya Vasiliev, um, a studio partner in, uh, in Peru, um, we asked them to find a, um, a, um, a, a Peruvian activist blog and we'd, we'd show them um, a little bit about packet tracing. They typed in the, the URL and we showed them that, that the network traffic went, went from the, east of the, sorry, the west coast of the South American continent over to the east coast, hopped over to Madrid and then over into the, into the uh, east coast of the US where the site was actually hosted. We effectively showed them that, that all of the Peruvian traffic, at least in that part of Peru, was being tunneled through the conquistadors, through, through the Spanish. You know, that, that, that their sovereignty had just moved up and had been um, usurped by the corporate domain. Submarine cable map is amazing. It's really a, a, about seeing the land through the clouds. Um, I'm going to talk now, finally, the last thing is um, about a, a news tweak um, that I, I guess seeks to address both uh, trust and infrastructure um, alongside the, um, the, 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 the issue of, of, of the commons and our right to, to, to what is in that air, as again, you know, if the air we breathe is considered public, then why not that you know, why not that which passes through it? Maybe the air itself, with all its signal, all its electromagnetic phenomenon, could be a material. And, and what if it was a material? What could I do with it? And this project um, was done by um, Danya Vasiliev and, and myself. Um, it's, um, it's basically got this, um, this, uh, this treatise, Behind Every Mind is a Network, Own It. It, it takes the form of a very, very dreary, drab, boring wall plug. It's a simple little wall plug. There could be no more dreary, drab, boring looking object. One plugs it in the wall and it attacks the local wireless network routing all of the traffic um, through itself, allowing the owner of that box to go over to, to Madagascar, Kuala Lumpur, Auckland, New Zealand, and manipulate the news that's read on that, on that network. So you can change news headlines, um, election results, sporting results on that network. And it's, it's been a very successful project. We were lucky enough to get the golden Nika for it at Ars Electronica uh, last year. And, uh, and it's, it's now all over the world. We uploaded the instructions to build it. 
and they're, they're turning up right throughout South America, right through Asia, the US. Um, we can't sell them, but you can build them for about 35 bucks. I'm just going to show you a video now of this uh, project, and I'm going to leave it there. Wait. It's not that people think they're being subject to propaganda. If people don't think that, they aren't looking for that, they're much easier to propagandize. And that's the genius of our media system. Media is the nervous system of a democracy. If it's not functioning well, the democracy can't function. Thanks. So, any, any questions? Awesome, none, good. Okay, no questions, okay, there's one, no, good, there's none. Right, leave it there. Anyway, I'm gonna hang around for a bit if you wanna, if you wanna chat, I'm gonna have a water there, so, thanks. <laughs>